this yeah so in this interview lab i'm going to give you three problems and you choose which one you want to attack and uh, if you can do more than one that's fine that's completely fine what i'm looking for is that you understand the problem first you write some test cases this as discussed here that you run some test cases through it then you think about solving those problems how will you solve those problems in your own head okay suppose i give you a question right now okay this is a list of number is this sorted suppose this is a question is this is this list sorted suppose if that is the question suppose if that is the question right now you know at this point in your head that this is sorted right somehow you have computed that information now the real thing is how can you take this thought to paper that is the toughest part okay so think about this step 1 think how you are solving this in your head okay that's that's number 1 second you need to think about the time complexity of that simple easiest solution that you can think of right what is the time complexity of it then if possible apply the optimization then then basically disc- then think about the time complexity and construct the algorithm i want to go to go i want you to go to this stage construct an algorithm by constructing an al- al- algorithm what i what do i mean is you either write a pseudo code or you write english code i don't care okay you can write anything the main important thing is that you should be able to write it in a way that it can be coded into a computer later on right either java c++ python whatever you want to choose it should be able to you should be able to code it so when you write english don't just say i mean just sort the words think about think in terms of uh, computer science diction think think that they, they construct a list okay then from item number 1 to item number end do something like this so use computer science word in order to con- construct that today i will show you as well how you can do it and as usual after the class is done the line by line coding kind of thing will be available to you uh, through a video i mean it will be a, it will be a youtube video that you can find on my channel eventually it, i will upload it but this is the objective today okay that you should be able to construct the pseudo code and think about the complexity of your code and this is the exercise as well the exercise here is that basically thoughts and actual code okay there's a difference i give you any kind of problem i can ask you for example find duplicate numbers it will be easy for you to find but how do you write the code right taking this in to your mind basically and somehow translate this into a code this is the piece we are practicing okay if this piece is done once you can construct the algorithm then replacing each line of your pseudo code with with the real code is actually not a big deal okay so this is what we are trying to do i'm going to show you problems they are not that complicated and i'm going to share those problems with you uh, i'm going to give you the google link drive right now sorry google drive link manchu um yeah i have a question so for uh, time complexity uh, like should we do like the big o uh, yes. method right and yes. uh, figure out the complexity yes exactly exactly okay. or even if you don't know about big o or anything you can just think of the number of steps generally it's going to take for you to solve that problem that should be good enough okay so let me first of all share the link with you guys this is the lab fun and actually last time there was a hiccup let me share this copy the link and it's coming right in the chat to everybody now 
there you go you should have it and let me discuss the three problems that we have here today all of these problems have been asked in programming and in telephonic interviews and not very uncommon essentially let me bring up the pdf this is the pdf so those are the three problems okay take take couple of minutes to read it and then i will talk about these now in specifically i would if i would was to say then i would say the problem number third is actually the probably the easiest one of all these so you can uh, if you're looking for the easiest one then third one is going to be the easiest one other two are also not particularly very hard but they do require some tricks for sure now let's talk about these problems one by one so shortest distance between the two words right so given a list of words and two words in it which are guaranteed to be present inside the list find the shortest distance between the two words okay so let me copy this and put it there my okay so these are the words right now <clears throat> and can and salt are the target so you can see that this is the distance between the can and salt this is the shortest distance there is no other distance between can and salt right so you can count whatever the index 0 1 2 3 and 4 and this distance is 4 right now okay you can say whatever this 4 minus 0 is 4 that is the distance for the case number 1 for the case number 2 uh you can say uh this is problem and this is solved so problem is present here solved is present here and then problem is also present here so in this case there is one distance here and then there is one distance here this is one units this is two units so you have to find you have to report this one as the answer okay <clears throat> now once again when i give you this problem and i ask you 
you will be able to solve this problem in your head right away without worrying about too much. You don't have to think a lot in terms of getting the answer. It's just that you have to translate those thoughts now to a piece of paper. Okay, that's problem number one. Any questions in this problem before I move to the next one? Okay, let's go to the problem number two. Problem number two is basically you have an array which has some numbers and consider those numbers as vertical heights. And given that array, you'll be able to form a rectangle and you have to find the maximum area in that rectangle. Suppose this is the array. Okay, let me copy this. And let me choose a good color. Okay, let's design. So suppose this is the array. Okay, this is the index zero, this is the index one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Suppose these are the indexes. Okay, now taking index zero and one together, right, we can form a rectangle. This is the rectangle that can be formed. The area will be one units here. Then similarly, by taking five and seven together, we can form a rectangle <coughs> like this. So this will be the rectangle in that case. And the area can be the difference here multiplied by the height here, right? That would be the area. So you have to find the, the uh, maximum area that can be formed by doing this. So in this case, clearly the maximum area can be, uh, so for example, this, this, this can be one square, one potential square here. It looks like just to like through a human eye, to a human eye that this, Eight multiplied by whatever this distance is, or this 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 one other one, which is the seven is the height here. This height is seven multiplied by whatever this distance is. So clearly that wins at the moment. That is seven. Seven into seven is forty-nine, and that is the answer in this case. But given one such rectangle, given one such array, can you find the maximum area? That's the question. And finally, we have, uh, first of all, any questions in this particular problem? Okay, I'm gonna move to the third one. Third one is basically something like this. You have a flower bed, okay? <clears throat> so you have a flower bed. Think of it like an array, okay? With the indexes, zero, one, two, three, four, where each index is representing some kind of a lot in that, in that particular space. And you are given N flowers, all right? You're given N flowers. And you have to find out whether N flowers can be planted in this lot. The condition is that if you plant a flower anywhere, then the next adjacent slots, you cannot do anything. That means the two flowers cannot be adjacent to each other. So given that restriction, can you plant two flowers? Now, there is also one more thing. This array is given to you with either zero or one value. Zero means that the lot is empty. One means that there is a flower there. Okay. So if the array is, suppose that the array is something like, uh, suppose the array is, uh, one zero 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 one. Okay, that means that this looks something like this empty, 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 and then you have another flower, something here. Zero, one, two, three, four. Now, if I ask you n equals to one, can the one flower be planted here? If the answer is yes, then you return a true, otherwise, you return a false. The answer here in this case is going to be yes, because the new flower can go here. It will satisfy all the situation, all the conditions, I mean. <clears throat> but if I was to say n equals to two, then we will not be able to fit it. That will not, will not work. So those are the three problems that we have today. And once again, your objective is not to write the code, 
but uh, uh, not to write the code, but write the pseudo code, right? Which is something when somebody reads it, they should be able to translate it quickly back into the a piece of code just by reading it. Okay. It pseudo code is, is not supposed to be too vague as well. Now there's a question on chat that the, uh, is the answer is eight multiplied by eight. No, that's not the answer. The reason that's not the answer is because, uh, if you think of the indexes, basically, let me see if I can, uh, that, that's fine. If you think of the indexes, then this is one, two, three, four, five, six. So six minus one is five. This is the width, right? Five into eight is 40. If that is clear. Was that clear? I feel like it went by kind of fast uh, for problem one, two, and three, but I'm not sure anyone else. Uh, I mean, there's a document available for you. So you can read the problem again. You mean explaining the, the steps or where? Because I, I, I downloaded the, the document that I provided in the link. Yes. So that document contains the problem description. You can read the problem, the problem description. I was basically just explaining the problem. I have not shown any solution yet. So oh, okay. yeah, we'll be talking about solutions. So I'm now is the time I'm going to give you some time. Okay. So in on all of the meetups, it's usually 45 minutes kind of, but today I'm going to keep it 30 minutes. You pick one or two because this is the first meetup online. So I was explaining some rules. So you, you pick whatever one or two problems you want, and then we'll discuss. Um, again, the uh, thing is uh, to write the pseudocode, right? Yes, pseudocode, exactly. Okay. I'm going to talk about solutions now. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it was considerably less time, but many of you have posted solutions and uh, many of these solutions are correct. Although some of them are not testing every single thing. So I'm going to discuss these problems now. Okay. And I'm going to discuss some of the code. So let's look at the problem number one, which is the shortest distance between uh, two words. Okay, so let's copy this again and let me put it on my sketchbook. So let's look at this problem. So once again, we get we get this problem. Okay, let's say somebody has asked us this problem now and uh, we have to find the solution for this. Now, some of you have written pseudocode, which I think you, you, what you are intending to write is correct, but maybe the, maybe because of the, this gap that we have, that you are able to write and I have to read and understand, maybe that might be the gap, but let me go through this and you guys can verify yourself if, if that's what you're looking for as well. Suppose this problem is given to me. Okay. And I've been asked that, find the shortest distance between two words, two patterns, two characters or whatever, however you may want to think about it. Okay. If I was to do this, then the easiest way, for example, would be for me to just run a very brute force -ish comparison between the occurrence of all the targets. Suppose the target number one is can, that's target number one. And let's say can is present only once. And let's say the target number two is here. It's basically solved. 
right <clears throat> so i can start with can and look for every single possible solution where the solid is present if it's present here okay then measure the distance i can keep a running sum somewhere let's say this is my result somewhere keep the running sum there so if this is the case i'll put 4 here then i look for any other occurrence of can there is no occurrence hence this is the solution for the other scenario for example i can this this problem and solved right so the the this the target number 1 in that case is let me get rid of this so the target number 1 is problem which occurs two places and the target number 2 is uh basically solved which occurs here so once again this one can be let's say word 1 and this one can be word 2 i can write one loop to look for word 1 as soon as i find the word 1 i can look for all the possible combinations where I, wherever i can for, find the solved so i will find it here and i can report the distance as 2 so i am going to write a top loop like for something like for i in whatever array dot length right if word i is well let's say whatever word 1 then basically run another loop for j in Array dot length, something like this, right? And then scan till I find word j equals to word two. And when I find the word j equals to word two, check the difference between j minus i. And check if the j minus i is already bigger than smaller than the current distance that we have. So in this case, let's say the result is somewhere equals to two. And if j minus i later on comes out. in this case here to be 1 then we just replace it let me write the pseudo code <clears throat> for this brute force approach quickly so suppose i'm here okay so i'm what i'm saying is i am actually can you keep your sketchboard along with the uh, this very writing is it possible um let me try Let Thank me try. You. Let me bring this guy from here over to here, and see if that helps. Let me put this here and move this little bit of here. Let's see. So this is once again this is the brute force algorithm that I'm writing. And today was once again my intent is to make you familiar with how to do it. So. So suppose I'm going to write. So first of all, I'm let's say I'm going to initialize a result. Result I'm going to say result equals to zero. Somewhat result equals to anything that you can write, which is can be code like, non-code like, but can be understood easily. Then I'm going to say for i in let's say array dot length. That means I'm saying for all of these indexes, I'm just going to introduce an indentation here and going to say for i in array length. Let's say if whatever array of i is equals to is equal to let's say whatever word one then at this point of time i'm going to run another loop for j in array dot length and i'm going to say if array of j equals to word two if those the two conditions are true that means you have found the two words in that case compute this j minus i right and initially we want we want to find the minimum minimum possible so what what do is here is keep this as to let's say plus infinity or keep this to array dot length right that's the maximum you can go one of the two so basically just look for then again result will be equals to minimum of either this or the existing result something like this and you continue this and in the end you basically return the result
So that's a very brute force solution. I don't know how, if you guys were attempting this solution or you guys were writing the more optimal solution, but that that's fine. Whatever you guys were writing, that's fine. But the, um, the complexity of this code, let's talk about the complexity of this code. Okay. What is the complexity? Um, uh, so I think the N square because it is, uh, yes. N, N square. Yes. Do you guys want to explain why this is N square? Uh, it's a loop within a loop nested, and then we are actually iterating all combinations of exploring all combinations between two, uh, you know, sentiment. Exactly, words. exactly. So, but just just a word of caution: a loop within a loop not always may mean n square. There are tricks sometimes that it's just a linear time. It's just how many times you are going to scan each item. Think in that way. In order to compute our answer, how many times are we scanning this item? So in the worst case scenario, let's say there are n occurrences of, let's say half of occurrences of these, then generally we'll be stopping n by two times here. Or, I mean, let's not complicate it. Okay, let me just copy this snippet over to my pad here. And so that this is, I'm gonna get rid of this, don't worry. And it's going to post post this here. So, so we can talk about the complexity. So we will establish some rules here. So I'm going to say this loop is going to run n number of times, right? And this will be some K number of times. Consider this an average case in the worst case scenario. Let's just put it, let's say n number of times. Then for each of these, this loop will be running n number of times, right? Then this one will run how many number of times for each i here, this step will go n, n multiplied by n times, right? So for each i, we're going to run this. So suppose uh, the, once again, the, I'm going to write just something like this. One, two, three, one, two, something like this. Suppose we are finding the shortest distance between two patterns here. So first we find this pattern. Then we're going to loop. So this is this part. We find that area of I equals to word one area of I is this. So I is fixated here. Now with this as a pivot point, we're going to scan the whole array to find the second pattern. We find it here. We find the difference. Then we're going to move here and repeat the same procedure. If, if this is once again, one or something, oh, sorry, sorry, this is two here. Then once again, we're going to repeat the whole pattern again, as soon as we find. So, uh, in this way, this is n square. And I have a class coming up on this Sunday, where basically we will explain more clearly how this time complexity works. So you'll be able to understand why this is n square, but you get the idea of how I'm writing pseudocode right now. It's not, uh, it's somewhat computerish computer code, but I also even going to use some English language. <clears throat> now coming to this. So just, 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 sorry yeah go ahead if the second word follows is always after the first word so yeah. w2 is always a w after w1 so does that in a way alter your time complexity like for j in i comma uh, start j let's start it from the index of i and then i of length so does it really change o of n square or it will be the same if, if you were going to say a condition that the let's say the word two should always occur after word one. After. Yeah, exactly. Even then, I think this will be n square, right? I'll let me, let me think about it, but even then it will be n square because anytime you set a pivot here and you scan the whole thing, that's going to be for each item here, you, you're scanning some n minus k elements, right? And n into n minus k will result in n square multiplied by n k. Sorry, n square oh. minus n k, which is equals to n square in the end. Yeah. So, Himanshu, oh, just thank one. You, thank you. Yeah, Himanshu? Yes. I think just to be safe on that uh, last line, you know, j minus i, we could say abs, absolute value. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Sorry. Sorry, to, sorry for the correction here. Yes, that's correct. We have to be absolute here. That's what, that will result in wrong answers otherwise. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Like if, if uh, the J, the word is earlier. If J is smaller than I, then J minus I will be the negative number. And in that case, negative will always be less than the current result. And hence it will be a wrong answer. 
So the absolute is yes, this is needed here, but that I think every, all of you have used in your solution, sure. but this is not the, um, ideal solution for this situation. This is an N square solution, right? You can propose yeah. this solution. That's fine. But then somebody's going to ask you, can you propose a better solution? And which brings us to the topic of this meetup basically, which is today we're talking about arrays in arrays. There are two or three fundamental ways of solving many problems. Okay. So one of the way is called two pointer approach. The other one is called sliding window. Right. These are techniques. Sliding window in many cases reduces your n square to n. And but there is a pattern that you have to understand that it will whether it will apply or not in that particular situation. And in this situation, it will apply. Let me show you how it will apply. Okay. Let me create this. First of all, let me explain what sliding window is. I'm going to use once again my numbers here. Suppose you have something like that. Suppose you have, okay. And assume that we need to find the shortest distance between one and three. Okay. Once again, just for the sake of it, we are just using numbers. You can think of this as strings as well. That's fine because I don't want to write big strings. Okay. Suppose you want to find the shortest distance between the two. Now, how does sliding window work? Okay. Let me show you what you do is there is a window. There is a left end of the window. You can call it I and there's a right end, uh, right end of the window is called J. This is called X or Y. You can, whatever variable you want to choose be up to you. But basically the rule of sliding window is that you have two boundaries. It starts with complete empty. You have two boundaries X and Y. X and Y, Y will move the window in this direction. That was, it will expand the window. And then when X moves here, it will compress the window, right? So at some point of time, let's say window is like this. When X moves here, it will compress the window and the window will be this size. And how X and Y will move depends on the condition. So I'm going to solve this problem using a sliding window. Suppose. I have the pattern here as one and three. I have to find the shortest distance between one and three. Okay. My X and Y are sitting here. So I'm going to write a logic that anytime I'm going to write just one for loop. The for loop is going to iterate from left to right here. And my logic is if I encounter any time the pattern number one, which is one, then I move X to that location. And if I find the pattern number two, then I move Y to that location. Okay. And anytime I see that X or Y have been moved, I calculate the length of the window at that time. That will give me the distance. Let me demonstrate that. So I'm going to run a loop, right? So let, let's say this is loop I X and Y. The loop will begin with index zero at index zero. I'm going to check whether the pattern is equals to one. Yes, that's correct. So X is going to move at this location. However, I'm not going to compute. Sorry, this is zero. I'm not going to compute this window because Y is in some uninitialized state. Y is not moved yet. So there is no window at the moment. Then I'm going to move I to location number one. I'm going to ask, does this match any of the patterns? No, it does not match. Okay. Then we don't need to do anything. So we, the window is still the same. It's basically zero and minus one. That is the window is window is not even formed yet. Then we go to the index number two. Here we see that does it match any pattern? Yes, it matches this pattern. Okay. So this is word number two that has matched. So let's move the Y here. So X remains at zero and Y moves to two. As soon as we get this, this is the window. Now let me use the color, different color to explain. So this is the new window. As soon as we have a window, we calculate the distance. Let's say this is the distance we are calculating. The answer is two so far. Okay. And that's the window. Now we, I is going to move to next index, which is three. This is four. It doesn't match any pattern. So we don't do anything to the window. Then we go to 
next four now i is this is one here that is it matches the first pattern that means i was here x was here y was here then so i moves directly to this location and as soon as x sorry x has moved to this direction as soon as x moves to this direction now at this point since x has changed and y is not negative one what is the window size now check this window size so the window size is going to come with, come back with some answer to so first of all the window is going to change so this it will become uh, index number whatever uh, 0 1 2 3 4 index 4 and this is still 2 and the window will be 2 still so kind of you get the idea so the window is changing now and the new window is that let me rub the original window okay it's a little hard to explain it but using these tools i'm still to master all these tools but okay so let's go this is the new window now this is the new window now on the next turn what will happen is we will find that this matches the pattern so y will move here and once again y minus x will be one and that would be the smallest window that would go to the answer the answer will become one at that point this will go to five and basically this will be four and this will be five but essentially we just do one loop and with the help of two variables which are controlling the length of the window which the window as it moves forward basically it compresses and shrinks in size and in the end it gives you the smallest possible window which is the answer which is why it's called sliding window both the ends move but the windows also shrink and expands so any question let me write the pseudo code for this okay so and now i'm going to write the sliding window one i'm going to get rid of this guy or actually let's start a new tab why why base this sliding window so i'm going to initialize let's say x2 minus 1 and y2 minus 1 and answer as let's say whatever the length of the array is or plus infinity one of the two you can also initialize this to a length of the array because that's the maximum window that you can get okay now i'm going to just write one loop for i in air dot length right so if array of i is basically is whatever the pattern number one if this is the pattern number one then at this point of time you move the x to i you're gonna move the x to that i location and then you're gonna check uh, basically um, the difference between y minus x so only basically if y is not minus one then basically y minus x whatever the absolute of y minus x is sorry whatever the absolute of y minus x is will be the answer and you can just check see answer equals to minimum of this or the answer itself either this can be the condition or maybe the other condition is something like if i'm going to just copy paste this whole thing if array of i equals to let's say w2 instead then then basically y becomes i in that case that is we're moving y and if x is basically in a situation where it has been initialized then once again calculate the answer as this and in the end if none of these conditions match then basically loop will keep moving backwards and then you just in the end return the answer let's understand the time complexity of this particular code aren't you where you're considering the length of the sliding window in that code in that last code the length of the window is so length of the window is controlled by x and y 
for oh, that window size it's the output okay okay yeah yeah the gap Got it exactly out. exactly so so now there is only one loop running right this is going to run n times this will run some k number of times let's consider worst case scenario n times then basically this will run n times in that case worst case scenario once again this is uh, so this condition will be checked n number of times but this loop may not be entered n number of times okay this may be some k number of times because only this we go to do if this if condition is true similarly this may be some k number of times some k number of times like that but essentially uh this will be n number of times this some k k k number of times whatever and then this is just one time you return the answer that's just one operation but essentially the n plus n plus whatever k will give you some 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 o of n time complexity that's the point so that's how the sliding window can take your n square algorithm to n right now there are several problems that we are going to practice in sliding window so it will become very clear eventually that how to use it again and again in your practice this is not just the one problem it's a very common pattern that occurs any questions and do we need both the cases like arri is w1 and arri w2 like you have two if conditions so can they be like are they both needed or just you have set for them like demonstration purpose no no they both are needed right so i mean can we combine them like in a way like how it was done like earlier like in brute force like you are combining them in like two loops but here like you are having two two times you are doing it right so is there anything we can combine or so you may be able to combine them as well but once again that will not change your time complexity just to let oh. you know, that will not change your time complexity in any way so i i choose this way because it's way more clear what we are trying to do so it's so that's the common pattern with sliding window you have one condition to expand left window and you have another condition to expand the right window when i say left window right window i mean left boundary and right boundary so if much you will be sending this code over right like or i mean you will be uploading such solutions later like to get yes i will so um this is actually a lead code problem you might be aware of that this is a lead code problem so i'm going to send the lead code link along with my pseudo code so you guys can use the pseudo code to try it try it out and also you will get a video later on where i will solve this on lead code and run it and make sure that the output runs for, for these approaches you are mentioning like yes exactly uh, so, okay thank you yep 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 you're going to get the full source code from me that's going to happen God, thanks a lot. All right, that's the problem number one. Now let's go to the problem number two. I think we're running out of time. We're going to shoot ahead. So if you guys have any commitment, please feel free to leave. Don't worry. And uh, I'm going to go to number two. Uh, Himanshu. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, uh, I was. I just got a draft approach of the solution of this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, instead of going like uh, what I thought is, uh, I, I I iterated the array, uh, then I put a dictionary. I just uh, um, created a uh, dictionary, and uh, uh, I was just trying to uh, uh, iterate the array, and then uh, if the uh, value index value is say it's equal to the first string then i'm creating a, a dictionary say initially i'm creating two dictionaries um say the say we have two strings a1 and b1 so you're, you're doing this what i'm showing on the screen right now right you have this dictionary number one where you are it's inserting for this word you're inserting the indexes for number two you're inserting the indexes yes, yes. yes. Right. yes. however how will you go after that is the question It, it could be a list. So the way I had it is, it's a hash map, right? Yeah. Uh, I just first order of n only. The only thing is extra space for the map. So I just loop through the uh, visit everything, and then as a list, I put all their indices. 
because there could be more than one occurrence. Right? Now, here's the, here's the thing. Yes, that's correct. Now, here's the thing. Once you get to this point, okay, once you get to this point, mm-hmm. how are you going to find the shortest distance now? Yeah, so after that, uh, so I, I've, I've populated my hash map, right? So now yeah. I'm given any two uh, words like W1 and W2. I just have to find out uh, the two uh, indices for the bo- both the words and one of them could be, if it's a list, then I just, it's all combinations, right? And then I see the abs of the difference between, let's say in this case, it is, you know, one comma three, one abs of one comma three, or let's say if there is, it is also three plus some other location, then I need to find out that to find the min and then sort it. But once again, if you notice what you're doing is you take this pivot here, then you scan this. Uh-huh. Then you take this pivot, then you scan this again. You take this pivot, then you scan this again. Inside the list, yeah. If there is more than one across. Yes. Right? So what you're doing is, it's the same solution. It's in a different disguise. It's the same solution of two loops. It's okay. in a different disguise now. That's okay. all. Uh, I got it, yeah. But this, I mean, it will work for you. That's, I'm, I'm 100% sure. Yes, I mean, it's, it's going to work for you. So there's no um, difficulty in that. In fact, so, this, is, this is one of the way in which I solved this problem for the first time as well. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, extra space also, like a map, right? Yes, a little bit of extra space. Yes, that's right. Okay, problem number two. The problem number two was the maximum area, right? Let's take this problem. Let's copy this problem over to the other side. Okay. How do we calculate the maximum area? Well, the simplest way to do it is a brute force. Once again, how do can we do a brute force? We can run two loops. Right, we can run two loops. The first loop is going to say for, let's say, i in this whole length, array dot length. Okay. Then we can write another loop for j in array dot length, such that when first i is set here, then j will be here then here, then here, then we will eventually move I to this position, first position and J here, here. So basically what we are doing is we are trying all the combination of width and height. So window of zero one, zero two, zero three, zero four, like that zero of eight, then one, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, all the possible combinations of windows. And then find the height, the minimum of the two height. Okay. So let me rub this. Let me rub this guy and let's try. Suppose I is zero and J is one. Then the area of the square will be J minus I multiplied by minimum of AI and AJ, right? Yeah. Whichever one is the minimum, in this case, one is minimum, that will be the area. That will be one unit area. Then we move J to here. So this becomes two. Then once again, similar logic, J minus I multiplied by minimum of AI and AJ, which is once again, this area now. So first we compute all the areas of rectangles that can be formed using I as the first edge. Then we do it the same way for the J. We compute all the possible rectangles, which can start from J. Then we can form all the uh, possible rectangles starting from the next two, then three, then four. So basically when you are four, the first rectangle would be this that you can compute. The next rectangle can be this guy, right? The next rectangle can be this guy. And the third rectangle can be this guy. Then the fourth rectangle can be this guy. So at each index, how many rectangles can you form? And you compute all of those rectangles and you keep a running track of the minimum area, sorry, maximum area. 
somewhere. So once again, a loop within a loop and you basically evaluate every single possible area. This is exactly how you generate all the substrings, for example. The time complexity in this case will be anybody? Work n square. N square. N square, right? Because for an array of size n, we are going to compute first from zero index will be multiplied by all the n vertices. Then the one will be multiplied by all the n vertices. Then two will be multiplied. And that's how it will move forward. It will result in n square. Okay. So that's the <clears throat> time complexity in this case. But once again, we have another approach to solve this problem. And that approach is called two pointer approach, which I think Makranth has used in his solution. It's called two pointer. The two pointer approach works the same way in which you guys, uh, in which we discussed how a string is palindrome or how, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, reversing a string, for example, when you want to reverse a string, let's say, suppose you have a string X, Y, Z, A, B, C, and you want to reverse a string. You set one item, one um, index at the beginning, one index at the end, and then you swap. So the string becomes C, Y, Z, A, B, X. Then or, and your pointers move one position in. Then you swap. And you keep doing till these two pointers meet each other. You keep doing that. So the two pointer approach will work here. I'm going to move a little faster because of the time. So don't worry. I'm just again going to paste this figure. So how does the two pointer approach is gonna work in this case? Let me just put the index five, six, seven, eight. This is again a lead code problem and I'm gonna give you a link after that. You set your left boundary here and your right boundary here. Okay, what? Your right boundary here and your left boundary here. Then, with the biggest distance possible, we calculate the area. What is the area in this case? The area will be the minimum height, which is one in this case, multiplied by eight, which will be eight square units. So let's say the result begins with eight square units. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to check which of the side is bigger right? One is smaller. So clearly, if we have to move forward, let's move the L here instead of R moving here because R is already pretty big. L is the bottling factor in this case so far because L is just one. So we come here and we come here and we check the height is eight. So the maximum area is going to be eight minus one, which is seven multiplied by this seven equals to 49. Wow. 49, which is bigger than our result. So we result moves to 49. Okay, now in this two, seven is smaller. So let's move seven to the next one. Next one is three. The next area to be formed is this guy, which will be three multiplied by seven minus one, which is six. 16 to 3 is 18, which is smaller than 49, so nothing changes. Then once again, 3 is smaller between 3 and 8, so this moves to this 8, and we move forward in this way. <laughs> Just one iteration that way, until left and right meet. So this will move, then here, then right will come here, I mean. And then basically, at this point of time, you can choose whatever one you want to move, that's up to you. And at this some point of time, what's going to happen is left and right will meet or left will be here and right will be here. So left has crossed right. So basically the condition has become something like this. At that point, you break the loop. At that point, you're going to break the loop and you're going to uh, end the iteration. And then whatever is the maximum, you're going to return that.
that's the solution. If you run it, that will be at O of n time. Because we're only iterating once again, one, one time with a while loop or with a while loop mostly and using two variables. So two variables once again are doing the trip. That's, a, that's called the two pointer approach. And finally, we have the third problem. You have a flower bed. When you see this problem, there might, might be multiple things that you might be thinking. This can be solved multiple ways. It's actually a, not a, that, that hard problem. It's just thinking of the different scenarios possibly. Like, do you think of all the test cases? What if there is only one lot, right? And you have one flower to, uh, sorry, if you have one or you have one flower to plant. then the answer would be yes. So when you have the leftmost, you don't need to worry about the right one. You just need to worry about this guy, right? So flower can always be planted here. Similarly for the right one, the flower can always be planted here. So the algorithm would be something like this, that you begin from left to right. Okay. You start from left to right and you have a count of flowers, right? And suppose these are the flowers, And suppose this is the situation right now. Okay. Then you check, can I plant it on the first position? The answer, the, there is already a flower, so I can't do anything. Now I go to one, can I plant here? The answer is, how do I check? The, I check whether I have this, do I have any adjacent? There is nothing here, but there is here. So I cannot plant here. I move to this location, this location. Can I plant here? There is no left, there is no right. Yes, I can plant here. So I plant here, I subtract the count by one, and then I put one here. One means that I've planted. Then I go to here. I cannot, then I go here, I can plant like that. And when I reach the array end, if I have not finished all the flowers here, then my answer is false. But at any point of time, suppose this was the situation, you have one and one, and suppose you have only one flower to plant. So you come here and you plant it. If at any point of time your n becomes zero, then your answer is true. You stop there and your answer has become zero. So you just write one loop from left to right and check the condition whether the flower can be planted there. If it can be planted, you just put the flower there. And if you have reached zero flower, then your answer is true at that point, essentially. So that is the third problem. Sorry, I have to rush because I mean, we are over time right now. And I will send all these solutions. But any question? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, even so one was like, in general, how do we write better pseudo codes? I think today's focus was there. And number two, on this problem, let's say we have two remaining slots, but we have three or four plants, you don't want the code to run, like you want to exit that. So is that something logical to make a quick count? Can you repeat what you're saying? Oh, you're saying if the have, size is already less and we have more flower, then why why bothering move why bother moving forward? Yeah, we can check a little, but then no point. Like, do we exit out early? Does that really change anything, or it doesn't matter because we are already O of n? It's still O of n. It will not change anything. Okay. So what you're saying is, is O of n better than let's say n minus two? Is that any better than this? That's what you're asking. Uh, Long it programs. Yeah, but it's just that we exit out early on an O of N, but it makes net change. If you see like net change won't be there, but we're exiting early. So, I mean, how is that meaningful or it's useless? I mean, it, uh, there is meaning. I mean, if there is meaning, if you can write a code, see, the only thing is to not complicate the code when it's not changing the order of your uh, algorithm. So suppose you have a n square algorithm, which can turn to n, then you can apply all kinds of optimizations and make it better. But if you have just few steps remaining and you want to, uh, 
if it requires a lot of trickery in here and there, then you might skip the trickery. Just keep the algorithm simple itself. However, in this case, yes, you can terminate early because this is a very simple check right now. It's a very simple check. And any other thing about pseudocode, are there better ways to write pseudocode like any any inputs like, I mean, or any inputs from whatever today's focus was? So there is a way I write pseudocode and I follow uh, an approach follow given by a book. Basically, you might not, you might know the book. I'm, I'll send you the link. It's, it's basically an introduction to algorithms by Corman or somebody, some the, the three, four professors. So they have an approach to write pseudocode. And uh, it's basically anytime, for example, there's a block that begins the indent automatically that I follow. So go back to the pseudocode. So I write like this. So now you can think that this is almost like Python like at the moment. But yeah, this is how I, I follow the pseudocode. I can write something like is here. Some, some, even the is is there in Python, but like some English is there. It's a cardinal. Yeah, it is cardinal. But uh, the way you have written the pseudocode, yeah, you can transform a bit in technical. Right now it's complete English. It's just, and for example, you have written uh, in your pseudocode, like something like iterate from left to iterate the sequence one, iterate the sequence two. That is okay. But still you can write a little, little more informative there. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be solving a lot of these. This is just the first session. So we'll get to this. So Saturday's class, will you be mapping any of these time complex? Like, will you use the same examples? Like we can build on top. That could be helpful. I mean, if you have a different set, that also is, I mean, fine. Sunday class, we're going to have, a, first of all, we're going to look into uh, what the time and space complexity is to begin with. Okay. 